all. This is um, basically a piece of a course that I give in uh, scientific uh, use of Python in scientific programming. And uh, it's usually a four hour course. We're going to do it in a half an hour and we'll see how far we get. Our goal is to talk about three different ways of calling index C from Python, CFFI, C types, and Cython. And in order to get the lecture accepted, I called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Not really sure how to relate that to the whole uh, lecture. And thanks for coming. There's a lecture about GrumPy and PyPy next door. As a PyPy core developer, I'd kind of like to be there, but uh, that's it. We're here, and we're going to do this thing. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, establish a test case. We're going to set up a couple of functions, uh, run them through pure Python, pure C, and then we're going to time the whole thing. And that'll set up the spectrum of where we expect to go. We expect that Python will be slow and C will be fast. And we're going to expect to find some ways to, to merge those two, two things together. We're going to use three different methodologies in order to do that. C types is a, a package that comes in the standard library. Um, a very, uh, very uh, established way into, to calling into C. CFFI is the new kid on the block. It's about four years old. Developed as part of the PyPy project. Also allows you to call into C from Python. And Cython, while it actually uh, does allow you to call C from Python, it does much, much more than that. It can actually compile Python into C. We won't be exploring that today. We'll only be exploring the, um, the interface abilities of Cython today. At the end, hopefully, we're going to have time for a comparison. That's the whole point of the lecture, is to do a comparison of the three different uh, methods. But in order to get to that point, we've got to run through a lot of material. There may be a pop quiz at the end, and then maybe we'll have time for questions. So here we go. Our mission is to create a fractal image. And first, we have to define what an image is. An image is a two-dimensional block of, of memory. But C, Python, whatever. Our computers don't actually have an idea of a two-dimensional block of memory. So we have to create that two-dimensional uh, perspective on our own. We're going to define a class in Python that has a width and a height and holds a bunch of data. And we're going to give it an init so that we can set the whole thing up. Our data is just going to be a byte array, which is an assignable array of characters. And we're going to instantiate a, an image with a width and a height, width of, a, of 1,500, a height of 1,000. That gives us about. 1.5 million pixels to work with. That's plenty of time to see the differences between C and Python. Now, in order to use that image that we've called into, we're going to have two functions. One function is going to loop over every pixel in the image, and it's going to calculate a value there. And the other function is going to be the function that actually does the calculation. So how many times have we been calling that inner function? We're going to be calling it one and a half million times. For each place in the picture, we're going to be in the image, we're going to be calling a, uh, a function, and we're going to have a looping function that's going to loop over them all. So two functions. Now we've got our, uh, we're working in a company. We're not actually uh, able to do everything we want to do. We've got a system architect, and our system architect was adamant in order to demonstrate to you the use of pointers in these three, in these three mythologies. Um, our system architect is adamant that every function return a status. And so our calculation function that has to actually calculate a value for a pixel in that image is going to accept a pointer to the value to be returned. Makes a lot of sense in C. In Python, it's a bit tricky to do that. But if we pass in something that we can index with square bracket 0, we can do that. And we're going to use a one val as an object that can be passed in as a pointer in Python. So here is our looping function. It's called create fractal. It does two loops, so here are the two for loops. And here it calls in the function. This is the function that was passed in. And it uses the one val in order to call into that function with certain values of real and imaginary. That's not really, um, not really part of what we, what we want to uh, show here today. But I, um, believe me that it works. And, uh, and then at the end, we use that one val, re-index it back to 0, and assign our image data at the proper place in the image to actually loop around the image and create our fractal image. So here's the actual calculating function. As I said, it takes a, a, a real and imaginary x and a y and a max iters and a value. And this value, then, we use the square brackets to dereference it to, to 0. And it returns a 0 when it, when it succeeds. And when after, 20, or when after the max iterations through the function 
we haven't yet hit the uh, uh, an absolute value of our imaginary number that's more than four, we're just going to return max iterators. We're going to return the value that we came out with. So that'll be our status to let us know how many times we actually calculated the function. In this case, max iterators and valid zero are the same thing, but that's what our system architect told us to do, so that's what we've got to do. OK, so we've got our two functions. We can now run them in Python. We create our one val by creating a byte array um, with length of one. And we call our pure Python create fu fractal function with our image, with our mandal function, and with our one val. And we ask it to do 20 iterations through the, um, through the, one, two, through the mandal function. If it hasn't hit uh, the, uh, the, if it hasn't hit four in that, uh, in that calculation, it's just going to return 20. We time the whole thing, and we print out some stuff, and we save it to save the image so that we can see what happened at the end. So uh, I'm not going to actually run it, but uh, the notebook works, believe me. Um, I'm just not all that good with uh, running things in, uh, in, a, in a lecture. I'm not David Beasley. Pure Python required 5.2 seconds on, on my little laptop here. Your times will vary depending on what kind of a computer you're running it on. And here is our, um, here's our fra where'd it go? There was our fractal image way back up there. There it is. Took us 5.2 seconds, and here's our pretty picture, so we know that everything worked. Okay, that was pure Python. So now we know Python is slow. We outsource the whole thing to a contractor. Contractor, being a contractor, does what a contractor does, which is he takes our Python code, and every line that was Python, he translates it to C. He establishes a complex number. In C, you have to um, initialize all of your variables. And then he calls through that loop. And if you look at this loop versus the Mandel loop that we had back up at the top, um, you'll see they look very, very similar. Of course, the char pointer now makes a lot more sense because uh, we're, we're doing in C. We could have here, again, done val square bracket 0. I chose to dereference the pointer like this. And then we also have our, our looping function, which is still also called create fractal. Looks very much like the um, like the Py like the Python version of the whole thing. We had to tell C about our structures and about our Mandel function, and here we call our Mandel function with with a one val that we've instantiated here with color, and we assign it to our image. Okay, the, the contractor provided a demo so that we can run the whole thing. Um, we're calling it main, so here's our main C. And then we compile the, uh, three, the three C files that he gave us. The two, the Mandel function and the create fractal function, we're compiling into a shared object. This is the way you compile a shared object with GCC into a library, libcreate. And we're compiling our main function as the executable. It needs to know about the create function shared object. And we're calling that main. So, how, what does main look like? Looks just like the Python one, just a lot more, a lot wordier. We have our two timers. We have our main function. We set up an image here and give it data. We uh, allocate a uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of unsigned chars and, and put it in, put that pointer into our image data. Call our create fractal C function with the image number of iterations. And then we have our timer start and stop. And we print out to the STD out how long it took to run the whole thing, save the data into a raw image, and close it. OK, and so here we can call that via Python. We, we have to set up an environment variable, ld library path, in order to find our shared object. And C, you'd be setting your path in order to find the DLL. And then we call into our main. We capture the STD out, and we get that create fractal required 200 milliseconds in C. And pure Python is 26 times slower than pure C. So I hope you followed along. No one screamed out, Arr! so I know that I'm not going too fast here. Um, we used 20 minutes of our time. Is there, no, 10 minutes of our time. Great. We've set out our spectrum of, of performance. On the one end, we've got Python. On the other end, we've got C. 
Now let's move on to what we actually came out here to do after we just take a look at the two pictures to make sure that everything looks hunky-dory and was working fine. Python, 5.2 seconds. Pure C, 200 milliseconds. Okay. Now let's start talking about what we came here to talk about. We wanted this, I'm just continuing the story, we wanted this uh, function to be part of a whole Python pipeline, so we don't want to actually use the main function that we got from our contractor. We want to be able to call into Create Fractal or Mandel from Python. How can we do that? We've heard about three methods, C-type, CFFI, and Cython. Let's try them all out. First of all, C-types. Of course, we do import C-types. Now, C-types has its own kind of little mini language that we have to learn and use. And uh, the mini language includes two important parts. One part is that we can define structures and, and, uh, and uh, we can define structures using C types that C can actually call in, that we can use to call into C. We have to define something new called fields with width that's an int, a height that's an int, and data that's a pointer to a, a char. Okay, well, how do we actually use that pointer thing? It's a bit tricky. It's not so straightforward. Remember, in C, it was pretty straightforward to assign to it. If I go back up to where we instantiated our whole, um, in the main, where we instantiated our image data, we just allocated using a malloc here and stuck it into image data, and everything was fine. But in Python, we've got a kind of a, uh, uh, we've got a contrast here between a Python object and a C object. And it's not clear who has to manage the memory that's in that C object and in that Python object. So we've, we've defined it the same way we defined it in C. But when we go about and allocate it, here we've got an init function that's going to init, that's going to set up our, uh, our, our C, C types image. It actually has to allocate an array of C types, C uint, uh, uint 8, which is an unsigned character. So this stuff I've highlighted here is actually creating an array class, okay? We've got a, it's actually creating a class of a C-types array, and then here we go and instantiate it. So now we have an instantiated object of a class of a C-types array that's an array of memory that we can use to call into C with. And we can assign that to our pointer here, but the problem is that we can't get that data back out because that pointer, this self-data, has no idea how big that pointer was, much like in malloc, we, know, we have no idea, after we've done a malloc, how big the pointer is. So I've defined another function here, a helper function, to get our data back out of our, uh, of our image object. And the, the as memory view actually does the opposite of what this line does. It creates another array of the size of the image. And then it goes and one at a time assigns those values to our, um, to our output that we're going to return from this uh, as memory view function or method. Now, there's probably a better way to do this. Um, I wanted to do it in four rows. There's probably someone can um, come up with a more more efficient or more cleaner uh, with a cleaner way to do this. You can do a mem copy in C types and many other ways. But just to prove my, my point, I wanted to do, uh, um, move forward with this and explicit trumps implicit. So here's an explicit way to copy memory from one data structure to another. So here we go. We can instantiate a C types image like that with width and the height, which then consequently allocates our data. We've now got an image that we can call into C with. So now we can load the DLL or the shared object. We actually know where it is, okay? We call C type C DLL load library that pulls that library and wraps it up so that the handle to that library so that Python can then fish out functions from it. And we go and fish the function pointers out of that. Okay, so that DLL, that shared object, exposed two functions. It exposed the create fractal function and the mandel function. Those are the ones in C that we got from the contractor, right? And so we just pull those pointers out. We assigned it to a, uh, to a, to a, a variable. And we have to tell C types, what type of arguments we're expecting that function to be called with. 
These are the call. These are the um, arguments that we expect the function to be called with. It's a reference to a C-types image, not a pointer or a reference, and a, and uh, int, as a regular int. And our Mandel function, if you remember from before, takes a float, a float, an int, and a pointer two-way chug, unsigned chug. Okay, let's run this thing twice. No one's saying ah, so I'm running ahead. Um, we're going to use this thing twice. Once we're going to call the C implementation of, cre of create, don't double click. We're going to um, call this thing twice. Once to call the C implementation of create fractal. And again, with the Python implementation of cre create fractal, remember that Python function that we had here that leaps through twice, accepts a function and a one val, and calls um, our function 1.5 million times. So we're going to call that one as well, which calls the cmandel function 1.5 million times. So first is a timer and the create fractal C types. How many times is the C type fractal C types going to call into C? Once. Okay. And we're also going to call it with our create fractal image, which is a pure Python function, calling into the mandel C types function. How many times is it going to call mandel C types? One and a half million. Okay. And we run all that, and it um, C types calling the create fractal function required 200 milliseconds, pretty close to what the C one was, right? We wouldn't expect a big difference. It's just calling once into a C function. Wouldn't expect a whole lot of difference between running the main and running the, the create fractal. When we call into Mandel, though, we're calling that function one and a half million times. Takes a bit of time. Okay, let's just prove that. Everything came out hunky-dory. We'll see the two images. This is the C types with the one function call, C types with one and a half million calls. The images look hopefully exactly the same. We could write a test. Anyone who was in the test uh, lecture a couple hours ago should, should know that we should be writing a test here. CFFI. CFFI is a, is a newer way to do the same thing. Um, Import CFFI. Now we create something called FFI. FFI is a is an instance of a class called FFI. It will hold the state of everything that the C types uh, imports did above. And all we do with that FFI is we give it uh, the header function. Yeah, we give it the header function from create fractal. That header function has our struct and has our two function definitions. And we this is the important part. We call FFI CDEF and tell FFI, tell CFFI that these are the function declarations and the structures that we're going to use subsequently in the shared object. And then again, we open the shared object. But all we have to do is open it up. Okay, we don't have to actually tell it what functions we're going to call from it because that we did here. We did that in this function call. So these two function calls together, the CDEF and the DL open, set us all up so that we can call into CFFI. Okay? And we're going to do exactly the same thing we did before, so I'm going to run through this quickly. Just one little tricky thing here, when we talked about the pointer before, here's how you set up a pointer in FFI. Now what's the problem? Why did I write no, no, no? Anybody know? The problem is that this is a pointer to some kind of C data. Nobody's keeping that data alive on the Python side. We've got actually a par two parallel worlds. And in those parallel worlds, we've got to keep the data alive on both sides of it. So we've got to keep our Python object alive in order to call it from C. So we can not actually do this. We can, but it'll, it'll, it'll crash our Python interpreter because the minute that this function, this call goes out of scope. The minute this object goes out of scope, which is as soon as we um, leave this declaration, this Python object will be collected by the garbage collector in CPython. So we actually need to create an object and keep that data around. Okay, so we assign that data, that object to the data we've kept around. And then we go ahead and call as we've done before, calling our create, our DLL create fractal, which is the C1 and calling our pure Python create fractal, which is the um, 1.5 million calls through DLL Mandel with a value that we set up here. 
Again, we kept it around. And CFFI calling required about 200 millis, but calling Mandel 1.5 million times is a bit faster than C-types. OK, I'm a bit running out of time, so I'm going to run ahead here. You can, you can see that the lost my place, very good, that the CFFI call produced uh, the same images that we're used to seeing. So now let's move on to Cython. And as I said, Cython is actually usually used for compiling Python code to C. So some people would say, maybe this is a foul, maybe it's not so good, but we already have our C code from our contractor, so it's not really Cython that's ugly, but my use of it, I apologize. So Cython Notebook has a very nice way of calling into Cython. You can actually, once you've done load x Cython, the uh, Jupyter Notebook, you can use this uh, percent percent Cython um, magic to tell the Jupyter Notebook that everything that comes below this is actually going to be Cython code. Cython is a mini language that looks like Python, but it's got extensions. When you compile it, it needs a compiler. You compile it, it produces a shared object or a DLL or a Python module that's written in C. And uh, the Jupyter Notebook actually handles loading that into our namespace for us so that we can then call these functions that we've defined here just as they look like regular Python functions in the Jupyter Notebook. They're actually functions in a C extensions module produced by Cython. So how does it all look? This is the way we define our struct, our C-level struct in Cython. We have to use this new word, C type def, and we have to use a C def extern and import stuff from this header file. But other than that, it looks pretty much the same. And our function declarations look pretty much the same as they did in C. And note that the we use a Python-like syntax in this Cython file. Um, with the uh, colon defining a function definition, but a lot of the keywords of C are also recognized here. CDEF means um, create this as a C object and not as a Python object, so we create all of our objects here, we get things going, and this is actually a wrapper function that will wrap our create fractal, our C level create fractal, with a, something we can call from Python. OK, in the same way, we wrap our Mandel function. Um, we have to do some playing around here in order to get the pi image data into our unsigned, char, unsigned, char, unsigned character. But it's a lot less playing around than we had to do with C types and with CFFI. And again, with our Mandel function, it looks like a C call here. One nice thing that uh, Cython inside the Jupyter Notebook will do for you is it'll show you where it's creating tons and tons of C API calls in order to translate what you set in Cython into, um, into uh, what it will then compile into the C module. So you can see where your code's slow. If you have a lot of dark yellow lines in your functions, then you know that, uh, bright yellow lines, then you know that you've got a lot of C code behind there. You know you've got a lot of stuff that you've got to clean up. So we see that our functions here, the only things that are starred are the, uh, are the function calls themselves. And I'm going to have to run forward because we want to get to the conclusions. That's the whole point of this aria, um, lecture. So we do the same thing we did before. We call create, Cython create fractal, and we do create fractal with the 1.5 million calls, and we time it. And Cython's a bit better than C types and CFFI. And we make sure that the whole thing looks good. Whew, and now we're ready to get to the conclusions. So let's try and make a little table here that compares create fractal in Python to create fractal in C. When we're using pure Python, create fractal in Python took 5.2 seconds, 5,000 milliseconds, okay? In pure C, 200 milliseconds. C types, two and a half seconds versus, and all the C calls are pretty much the same thing. Calling one time into a function doesn't really matter that much. But calling one and a half million times, we can see that CFFI and Cython are pretty much neck and neck. Cython's got a small advantage. Um, and C types is way behind. OK, there are a few things that you want to think about when you think about a framework other than speed. One is maintainability. What will happen when your C code changes? 
you're gonna, if your C code changes, you're gonna have to change something in your Python. For CF for C types and for Cython, you're gonna have to do pretty large changes. For CFFI, you just have to work, you just have to make sure that header file gets updated and then everything works. Compiler, do you need a compiler on your target machine? C types doesn't need one. CFFI, the way we showed it now, doesn't need one. C Cython requires one. CFFI has another mode of compilation that's a bit faster and it does require one then. Bugs, okay. We talked about the mini language. Both C types and Cython use a specific mini language that you've gotta learn. It's another little mini language inside of Python that you've gotta learn all of its little corners. It took me quite a while to work out exactly how to define that Cython. I'm not a real Cython expert. It took me a while to work out how to call those um, C structures from Cython. Um, CFFI is standard C. The lib, the new thing is a bit, uh, a bit uh, different, but it's not a whole mini language. It's just a way of calling C from Python. Cython does a lot of, st of magic automatically. It's really nice, does some really nice stuff. And CFFI can be tricky for C-level pointers and can sometimes lead to some um, crashes and bugs. Productivity, okay? There's always this trade-off between speed and productivity. Cython's heavily optimized, tightly integrates the C API, and it really gives you fast, clean, fast, clean Python code. If you look under the shell, it's really messy. If the headers are pure, CFFI should be very simple. And projects exist to wrap all three to create wrapper functions. So, don't know if we're gonna have time for the pop quiz, but I'll do it real quick. Um, C types, not really maintained. It's got some bugs listed for about six or seven years. Uh, CFFI and Cython are pretty good as far as that goes. Okay. If we run this um, code in pure PyPy, can't help it. I'm a PyPy core developer, right? I gotta talk about PyPy. It's, it's, in, my, it's in my DNA. Um, if we run the pure Python version in, uh, in PyPy, what do you think we'll get? We could get a two times speed up. We could get something like CFFI or C, or we could get something like what C compiled. Anybody wanna guess? Oh, you already saw it, okay. Okay, so here's the script, run through it, and there it is, 158 milliseconds on my computer using latest uh, nightly CFFI, uh, nightly uh, PyPy. Um, yeah, it's nice, it's nice. And just to prove that it really works, and that's about all the time we have, I guess, maybe one question? Maybe, I got one minute, yeah. so yeah, go ahead, shoot. Okay, so the question is, uh, 30 seconds left, is uh, how many people are actually using PyPy? We actually have very little idea. Because it's an open source project, people download it and use it. We only get feedback when we get problems. Um, there are some companies who have been sponsoring work on PyPy. That's the way we know that people are using it. Mozilla gave us a nice grant to move uh, PyPy 3 forward. But I'd rather not talk about that now. I kind of want to talk about, and I'd love to talk with you afterwards about yes. PyPy, but uh, yeah, okay. And questions about C type, CFFI, and Cython? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is why is CFFI faster than C types? Because um, on C Python, well, let's go back up to the table. On uh, C Python, CFFI uses a lot of the mechanisms of C types in order to make its calls. Okay, so C types does a lot of checking. When you get a pointer in C types, it's got to do a lot of playing around in order to get that pointer into a, into a state where it can call it. CFFI doesn't have to do that. Okay, CFFI prepares itself ahead of time to use pointers, and so it doesn't have to do a lot at runtime. Okay, it's, it's, kind of a, uh, it's kind of a solution that's somewhere between C types and Cython. It uses the C API, but not extensively in this case. Um, there's another case that will bring the time down to where Cython is where it actually does use much more of the, CF, of the C API. But it's worthwhile trying it out, CFFI. It's a nice little tool if you can get past the pointers and, uh, and getting, it, getting the header into a state where it can actually import it because it doesn't like macros, then it's a kind of a nice tool. Any more questions or can I take more questions? We're okay? Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, so the question is, do we need the header files compiled, uh, com deployed in the client machines? And the answer is, in this case, the way I did it here, yes. There's another way of running CFFI. You can actually 
um, do something Cython-like in CFFI, instead of calling just those two functions, cdef and load DLL, you call cdef and then compile, and that actually creates a uh, uh, C extensions module, much like Cython does, that you can then import just uh, from the regular um, Python interpreter. Okay, so that's a different way of using CFFI. I didn't have time in the half hour to, to show the whole thing, and I'm sorry I'm out of time. I'm happy to answer questions, and again, feedback is wonderful.